Virginia Beach, Virginia, is home to Tim and Emily Peterson. We've been married for almost 12 years, and we're still giggling. We're still having fun. We balance each other out pretty well. She's definitely more outgoing. I'm definitely more reserved. Emily runs a successful wedding planning business, and Tim is an endocrinologist. It's rewarding when you can solve a problem that's maybe been difficult to solve for somebody. The busy couple are raising three children, the youngest of whom is daughter Elia. Elia is such an easy-going, fun-loving, just happy-go-lucky baby. She's always smiling and cooing. Really could not have asked for a better baby. You'll find us together as a family more often than not. We enjoy being around each other. We enjoy that we have each other. But this harmonious family is about to be broken apart by an invisible intruder. It's a warm July evening. Emily is home alone with the children and has just sat down to feed three-month-old Elia. Normally she nurses like a champ. She knows exactly what to do and gets it done and then goes to sleep. But tonight, Emily is having trouble getting her baby to eat. She just didn't seem interested. She would start and then she would stop and she would look away. And I thought if she's really hungry, she'll wake up in the middle of the night. But by the next morning, Emily hasn't heard so much as a peep from her daughter. I went into Elia's room and she was smiling. She was happy. I was hopeful that maybe she was finally going to nurse. But again, she wanted nothing to do with it. And I thought, we're kind of pushing it now. We're going on probably 12 hours since she had had anything to eat. I did all of the normal checks. OK, is there a fever? Is there congestion? Is she getting a cold? The bizarre thing was none of those symptoms were happening. It was almost like she was perfectly fine, except for she didn't want to eat. Emily picks up the phone and calls Tim, who's just begun a long shift at the hospital. When I answered the phone, I heard concern and confusion. She wasn't sure what was going on. She wasn't even sure that Elliot was necessarily sick. She just knew something wasn't right. He felt like because there were no other signs or symptoms that were giving us any reason to worry, we were going to ride it out. For several hours, Emily keeps a close eye on Elia, and everything seems normal, until she puts her daughter down for an afternoon nap. I started to hear this just low, moaning cry. It was a really bizarre sound, but it was very muted. So it wasn't like she was really angry or needed something right away. It was almost like an uncomfortable cry. I thought, a cold's coming. A cold's coming, and she hasn't experienced one, and so she's maybe a little achy. Once again, Emily tries to feed Elia hoping it will ease her symptoms. I felt like the moan was getting worse. I wasn't sure why. Um, I kept thinking, I'm mom. I'm supposed to comfort her. Why am, I, why am I frustrating her? Then, after several failed attempts, Emily finally notices a change in her daughter's condition. But unfortunately, it's not the one she hoped for. Her head wasn't turning left or right. She was floppy. Her arms would flop to the side, and she wouldn't pick them back up as fast as she's used to picking them up. And I knew something was really wrong. Emily again contacts her husband. I was in the hospital, and I got the call from Emily. It was hard to not be able to assess her myself and to not get a better understanding of what was going on. Emily's got pretty sharp intuition. And when I heard that she had concern that Elia wasn't well, then I knew it needed to be further investigated. Tim agrees that Elia should be taken to the children's hospital immediately.
We walk into the ER, and I think I was so relieved <laughs> that we were finally at a place where somebody could help us figure out the problem. A short while later, when Tim arrives, he finds his daughter in a perilous position. She was weak. Her cry was very weak and uh, just looked like she wasn't doing well. My heart dropped, you know. It was a pretty sudden turn for her from the day before till now. The medical staff suspects that Elia's muscle weakness could be a sign of a viral infection, so they run blood tests. And that came back negative. And then they tested for all sorts of bacterias and things, and they all came back negative. I mean, everything was coming back negative. How can they help her if they don't even know what they're fighting? Doctors explained to Tim and Emily that since there is no obvious diagnosis, they'll need to expand their tests to include rarer illnesses. There was a lot thrown on the table. Could it be some form of cancer? Could it have been congenital um, issues uh, that normally would present themselves earlier, um, maybe coming to light now? Over the next few hours, as they wait for test results, Tim and Emily helplessly watch as their daughter's condition declines. Her cry grew weaker, her eyes grew heavier. There were times it sounded as if she couldn't quite catch her breath and she wasn't moving very much, and she wasn't eating. At that moment, I thought, she's done. She's done. There's no way we can do another 24 hours like this. I mean, her body, her body is shutting down. It was that moment that I was convinced I wasn't going to take my baby home from the hospital. But then, the medical team makes a potential breakthrough. Doctors inform Tim and Emily that Elia could be suffering from a rare neurological condition. The attending threw out the words Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a disorder in which the body's immune system attacks the nervous system. It only affects about one in 100,000 people, but among children, it's a leading cause of acute paralytic illness. Early symptoms include muscle weakness, pain, and difficulty breathing, but ultimately, it can lead to paralysis, and in some cases, even death. When I went to see her, the child was literally limp like a rag doll, and had absolutely no head control. The arms were hanging loose, legs were dangly. But as Dr. Tour examines Elia's feet, he notices something strange and it could prove key to figuring out what's wrong with the little girl. In Guillain-Barre syndrome, the weakness is ascending. It starts in the feet and then moves upward. But Elia can still move her feet. She had a descending type of paralysis. It starts in the head and neck area and then descends downward. Dr. Tour immediately rules out Guillain-Barre syndrome. And now, by process of elimination, he believes he knows what disease Elia is suffering from. I diagnosed Elia with infant botulism. Infant botulism is a disorder of the nervous system. It's caused by the spores of the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. Inside Elia, the spores multiply in her intestines, emitting a toxic chemical that is destroying her nerves. As it does so, it triggers a creeping paralysis that leaves her unable to eat, cry, and even breathe. When Dr. Tour first said that this is most likely infant botulism, my jaw dropped, and I said to myself, really? No way. I wanted to know what that meant. Does this mean she's going to die? Does this mean that she has this permanent, you know, disfigurement of some sort. Like, what does this mean?